I know it looks like Zach's body and my voice, but <laughs> I'm here. Trust me, I'm here. You know, Psalm 15, today's Psalm, O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? It says, he who walks with integrity. You know, I took a walk on a volcano in Hawaii. And that, not today, <laughs> but the Lord brought my attention to my feet where I was walking because it felt soft, but it was not hot lava. But what it was, was lava that had cooled. And I thought it was kind of neat because cool lava is kind of like rubber. It's like a little piece of rubber, you know, something that is deadly and dangerous, something that would kill you instantly, something that we couldn't survive with or on. You know, after a period of time, it cools, it hardens, and it even becomes pliable like rubber. This is lava. And you know what? What is impossible in the moment of the fiery trial that you're in just needs a little bit of wind from the Holy Spirit. God just has to say a word and blow, and all of a sudden, what is impossible is possible. And by the way, if he walked on the water, we can too, right? We call that winter in Michigan, don't we? <laughs> but you know, spiritually, we can walk on every single thing the Bible says you can even tread on serpents and it won't harm you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, receive our praise and thank you, Lord, because we are walking miracles, every one of us, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together, shall we?
those are the times that we have in you with you, Father. Cherish the moments that we have with you, Lord God. Those are special moments, Father God. Those are real moments in our lives, Lord God. Help us to commune with you on a daily basis, Father God. sometimes we are in comparison to your greatness and your glory, God, we would understand that we should come to you humbly, respectfully, in reverence to a holy God, a mighty God, a king above all kings, Lord. Just one day, Father, is better than any day without you. Hallelujah. As we get ready to uh, partake in the bread and the cup, let us just stay in that place of worship. Let us just stay in that place of reverence. Father, we just glorify your holy name. We glorify your holy name and who you are. As we come into this time and this holy communion, because we do know that it is holy, because our God is holy, Paul tells us to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are in right standing with the Father. Not, not to be condem condemning us in any way, but just to make sure that we always have that place of reverence, that we always have that knowing of how holy our Father is and we should always want to come before Him with clean hands and a pure heart, but also understanding what this sacrament is. And so, Father, I come before you now. And we all come before you as the church, as the body of Christ. And we say, examine us, O God. For anything today, Lord, that we may have done, we may have thought, we may have said, that does not bring you glory, Father, we repent. We repent before you right now, Father. We want to come before you with clean hands and a pure heart because you are so good. You deserve the best. So, Father, we just ask that you cleanse us, that you wash us with the blood of Jesus that takes away the sin of the world, <laughs> the blood of the Lamb. Wash us, Father. Prepare our hearts. Bring us into that place of union with you, Father. That place where you wish to abide with us all of our days. Father, we just praise you. We thank you. 
we praise your holy name. Oh, Father, on that night, that night that you were betrayed, you sat down with your disciples. You sat down with these men that you loved, these men that you were just pouring your life into for the last three and a half years. And at this time, you were just so anxious to sit down with them and share this, this cup and this bread. And as they were sitting, you took that bread and you broke that bread. And you looked at them and you said, this is my body. This is my body that is broken for you. He said, as often as you do this, as often as you take this bread, we want you to remember, I want you to remember that it was my body that was broken for you. And as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. So as the body of Christ, we come together and we take the bread, the body of Christ. Let us take in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And in the same way, he took that cup and he blessed it. And he said, this cup is, represents the new covenant. The new covenant. And it represents my blood. Oh, my blood that is being poured out to take away the sin of the world as a ransom. The blood of Jesus, such a powerful, powerful thing. It gives life. And even new life. says, as often as you take of this cup, you do this in remembrance of me. Church, let us take the blood of Christ in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We praise you for going to the cross. For, for bearing our sins upon you. We thank you that you have called us into your family and that we are one with you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for us. We praise you. We glorify you. Have your way tonight, Father. Have your way tonight. Let us become one with you, Father. Let that be our prayer. Let that be our desire. To have that communion with you on a daily basis. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, part of the the sacrament of communion also reminds us of the healing that was won for us. So in this moment, if you have a need in your body, or if you're thinking of someone 
who's in need right now. It may not even be physical. I know, think of families that are traveling right now. We're going to just ask to the Lord that his blood will cover us and provide the healing that was already paid for on the cross. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, because the sacrament of communion is also the sacrament of healing. Hallelujah. We pray for healing, whatever part of the body that is in need, Lord, it is a part that you've healed somewhere already. You've already paid for it, and someone's already been healed in that part of their body, so we know that you are able, so we ask for your healing virtue, especially in the body of Christ. And those who are listening right now, it matters to you, because it matters to them. Whatever touches your children touches your heart. And Father, we pray for those who are traveling. Lord, some that we've already prayed for, we've sent them on their way for this assignment by the Holy Spirit that there will be safety and protection, wonderful journeys, Lord, and that there'll be peace until we come back together again with the testimony of your goodness to bring you glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. The Lord is good, isn't he? He's a good God. And so at this time, um, let me encourage you. We've got some things that are coming up. You can check your schedules. Um, and somebody asked me a question. Why do I need the Church Center app? And I thought, well, that's a great question. And I can only think of about 10 reasons. One of them is that app has notified me about upcoming events. It's a great form of communication. How many had any power outages or blinks this week? Right? Anybody have some power blinks? You know what a power blink is? You were sleeping. That's why you don't know. It was, it was the middle of the night. But what I'm saying is we don't know that forms of communication are always reliable. But I can tell you this, we're doing our best to communicate as a family. So that's one reason I can give you today of the notification. Secondly, a lot of times people want to go to things. For example, um, Monday night, the women had an event. And whenever we register for those events, when we have links that you're trying to copy and paste on your phone, take pictures of our slides, write down the words, and then you get it wrong and you say, oh, I put an S in and it's not graduates. I told someone to register their son by saying ChristFamily.com forward slash graduates. They said, the link doesn't work. Well, yeah, I put an S in it. But if you went to the Church Center app, you found that activity or that announcement on the calendar the link's right there. You touch it, and it takes you. You don't write anything. It's amazing, isn't it? And somebody told me on Sunday, Pastor Pat, this is the first time we've ever given using the Church Center app. And they had a big smile on their face because it was so easy. Isn't God good? All right. Well, listen, we're going to get into the Word of God. We're dismissing our kids and our youth right now. You guys can go. I think most of them left already, but a few of them want to stay for the message, and I understand that, want to have you here too, but there's people prepared and ready. By the way, if I forget, would you remind me, if you're watching online, you can post it in the comments, remind me to have our kids share our scripture verses because I have a box full of free ice cream cone cards that we want, we want to give some away. So I know the kids are memorizing their verses. All right, we're going to go through some scriptures together. You see our, our theme behind us. What's our theme for the year? What is it? All right, steadfast. That's right. And you know what that word, what's the word steadfast mean? All right, hey, come on, guys, move up a little bit. That way I don't have to talk that loud. Come on, up in the first couple rows. Come on up here, you guys. You know what? 
if you go to a baseball game, do you know what they call the first 10 rows at Comerica Park? You know what they call them? They call them box seats, right? And you know how much those tickets are? Neither do I because I haven't sat in them. But you know what? I'm pretty sure the answer to the question is expensive. I'm willing today to give you box seats for free. There you go. Come on now. Hey, Robin, if we have a gathering of too many leaders in kids' train, send them out. I want to preach to those guys. All right. Let's look at Scripture together. Now, we are in Acts chapter 9. I have some very important concepts to speak to you today. And so let's read the Scripture first. It says, now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up, I don't know if he was sleeping, and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of, what's his name? Judas, Judas that's right. For a man named, a man from Tarsus named Saul, what, why? For he is praying. Can you imagine when you're praying, God's got some people on alert because of your prayers? Do you know that your prayers wake people up? Do you know that? I'm suspicious that Ananias was asleep, that God spoke to him in the middle of the night. You can read the original language and get some clues there. I don't want to take time to do that because it's not that important to the point. But here's the cool thing. Someone was praying and God was waking Ananias up. And he has seen a vision, seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. King James says he's a chosen vessel. I like that too. We're going to look at that. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. The next verse is equally important, but you can read that later on on your own. Today I want to talk to you about greatly used of God. Can you say that with me? Greatly used of God. That's a great prayer. I mean, let's just think about that. Lord, I want to be greatly used of God. You've heard of people who are greatly used of God. You know why you've heard of them? Because they were greatly used of God. And you remember old what's-his-name that God never used because he wasn't obedient? I don't remember his name either because he wasn't greatly used of God. But I can think of people who were. Now, let me tell you an honest truth. There's this thing in pastoral circles, little secrets that some people know, and we talk about it when pastors get together. And here's one. If you want to get people's attention in church, just do this. Yeah, that's right. Put a picture of a cute puppy up on the screen. That's all you have to do is put up, and, and sometimes people do that. I would never do this, but other people, they find the cutest puppy, they put them on the screen, they get everybody's attention. Now, some of you think that I don't like animals, and I don't know why you think that, but uh, when I was growing up, we had a dog. We had a Labrador, one of the best dogs to own. A Labrador and Beagle mixed, and he was a sweetheart. His name was Lightning, and he used to sleep in my room. And Lightning was on my bed every night. Here's the problem. He was pitch black in color. He had no color to him. He was just pitch black. And so when the lights went out, you could not see him. And he always slept on my bed. Well, one day a missionary from India and his wife came. And, of course, when we had people back in the day, we didn't put them in hotels. They stayed with us. All missionaries stayed with the pastor. And because it was a couple, my dad didn't feel comfortable with them being in the guest room in a single bed. So he asked me to give up my room to the missionary couple from India, which I was glad to do. 
But he said one thing to them. He said, brother, please just make sure you close the door all the way when you go to bed. But this dear, sweet brother closed the door most of the way, closed the light, hopped in bed with him and his wife. And when he fell asleep in the middle of the night, that door opened and that dog jumped onto the bed. He didn't know what it was. He thought someone had jumped onto the bed to attack him. And all of a sudden we hear screams, yells, screeches. We all go running upstairs and there they were in their night shirts and the dog just sitting on the bed and we turned the light on. It was pretty funny. Not to them, that is true. They stayed a few nights, but I'm going to tell you, they learned to close that door all the way. You know what I'm saying? What is cute to one person is not cute to another. But let me ask you this question. A puppy is not fully grown. Those, some of those cute puppies, we found a whole litter of puppies that were abandoned in a park when my children were little. And we had to call the... Uh, ranger and oddly enough he did something he broke his own rules he let us take one home he wasn't supposed to but the kids were crying they wanted one of these and it was the cutest little dog cute little puppy but here's the weird thing that dog grew up to be one of the ugliest dogs it was such a mix it looked like one of those uh, dogs in the Dr. Seuss books. And I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. He had short hair in the front, long hair in the back. His back legs were longer than his front legs, so he leaned. One ear was broken over, and the other one stood straight up. He was just an ugly dog. We loved him anyways, but he kept breaking out of our yard, and the lady across the street, her husband passed away. And after the third time of rescuing him, because he kept running into the street, she said, would you mind... If I made this dog my dog and you had permission, I'll feed him, take care of him, he'll live with me. You can come and see him and your kids anytime, but I'll let him be my dog. I, I almost fell over and started speaking in tongues. I was so happy. My kids were so upset, but they never did a thing for that dog. And in the end, it was a perfect agreement. She changed his name, which didn't offend me, and she called him, you're not going to believe it, Snoopy. So Benny became Snoopy. But, you know, puppies grow up. But here's the question. Why do I need to grow up? Why can't I stay a cute little puppy forever? I mean, you kind of wish that of puppies, and sometimes you wish that of your own children. But the truth is they have to grow up. I want you to look at a verse with me. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. Very unusual verse. No one ever preaches on it, uh, at least anymore anyways. But I'm going to ask you a question. Look at this verse. It's a verse about a man named Enoch. And Enoch was a fully mature believer in Yahweh. He was God's man. And the Bible says Enoch, this is the way he described it, walked with God. I love that. Remember Adam in the garden? Well, Enoch walked with God. God and Enoch were tight. Enoch was not immature. He was a mature believer. But look at this next phrase. And he was not. Now you've got to ask the question, he was not what? <laughs> was, and he was not. What does that mean? I love that verse. Enoch walked with God and he was not. And I always think like, all right, who took out the word? That's missing, and he was not. But it's a unique truth about a man who never died. Can you imagine that? Enoch didn't die because, look what it says, God took him. This relationship between him and God was so tight, so real, so powerful, so alive, that God needed him full-time in heaven. And I know some of us have lost some of the most wonderful people in our lives. And the pain is real and great. But I believe in Scripture we have evidence that there are times where God takes people because he wants to be nearer to them. And I don't think anybody who ever went to heaven complained and asked for their money back. Can I get an amen? Say, Enoch. Walked with God, and he was not. You know, he's a great example of someone who matures. 
See, I want to apologize to you for something because, look it, you and I are a part of the miraculous church. That's just what we're a part of. We cannot stay immature our entire lives. I'm sorry, but you know what? God has called us to be women of faith and men of faith. He's looking for more Enoch's, people that he loves so much that he cannot be without and that can't be without him. They want to be greatly used of God, and God, here, let me tell you the truth, wants to greatly use them. What am I trying to say? Look at this. Growing in Christ is essential. I want you to see this. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down because you need to remind your spirit. Growing in God is essential. It is not optional. You do not have the choice between growing and not growing. It's essential. And I'm going to tell you why. This is why this is the big idea tonight. Once you think about this, remember that everything in the natural has a spiritual counterpart. You know why you have to grow? Because it's the only way to reproduce. See, that puppy can't have more puppies. That puppy can't reproduce in its breed. That puppy cannot continue to procreate that very item and, 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 and that, that, that uh, dog. It's impossible. He has to grow up. It's the only way. And so there may be a reason why in many places there's a decline in the kingdom of God or at least the church. Because there are immature believers who do not have the ability to reproduce. They don't have it in them, and I'm being both literal and metaphorical. They don't have it in them. Growing in Christ is essential. It's the only way. Now, I want to tell, tell you something here. You know, people have to work to pay bills. This economy that's we're experiencing right now is a difficult one. I want to remind you that for some of us who've been around a little bit longer than others, we've been through these things. This reminds me very much of the early 80s, which some of you will not remember, but I do. I started in a certain area of the workforce right around that time, and it was tough, tough, tough. Prices were out of control, and we were screaming 79 cents a gallon for gasoline. I'm so mad. <laughs> it almost seems funny today. But why am I saying this? You've got to work to pay bills. That's life. But a cause is really why you live. You may work to live to pay bills, but a cause is the only reason to live. And that's why I tell young people and students, you know what? You need a career, but you also need a calling. Every human being has to survive. You're not going to just be able to live on your good looks alone. You need a career, but you know what? You got to have a calling. There has to be a cause in your life. When I was graduating high school, I can remember the fear and the dread that came over me at one, one brief moment of my life because I was absolutely unsure. I had no cause in my life. I, I was a believer in one sense, but I really wasn't growing. I wasn't mature. And there was something about that time in my life that I just seemed very unsure. I didn't seem like I had anything that I was really living for. And you know what? The only jobs that were available back in that time, and I'm talking about the late 70s, were factory jobs. And so I took a job in a factory, a forging plant. It was horrible, terrible. I mean, the temperature was like 120 degrees, and I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. And it was dirty and smelly and loud. And I remember being on the job and really as an adult crying, tears coming down my face. And I said, Lord, what am I doing here? 
Now, I, I had to work because nobody was going to pay my way through college, and I knew that I wanted to learn more and prepare. So I had to go to work. But you know what's amazing is I ran into some of the worst unbelievers I'd ever run into in my life. I'd never known a type of person like this. And they came at me fast and furious, one in particular that just drove me crazy. He was so vulgar, so mean, and it was so horrible because he even looked greasy and dirty. It looked like if he fell out of his, off his bicycle, he would have skidded for a half a mile. I mean, it was terrible. And I know that in the plants, sometimes we had to look that way, but he looked horrible, sounded horrible, and was mean. And every lunch, he would do the same thing. He'd load up his car, they'd drive to a party store, they'd buy liquor and smoke marijuana, and get high, and then come back to work, heavy machinery around all the rest of us. It didn't make sense. And when he came back in the plant, he walked by where I was, and because I didn't do these things, he would bang on the fence and the metal right by where I was sitting and working. And if you ever had metal hit metal, it's loud, and you would jump, and he'd laugh like the devil and then curse at me and walk away. And do you know, it was at that moment that God began to speak to me and said, you know what your cause is? It's me. It's bringing the gospel to the darkest places of my life. And I had the argument of a lifetime with God because I was one man, and it seemed like the whole place was full of evil unbelievers. I mean, it looked dirty, it smelled dirty, and the rats, I mean, you know, you could ride them. They were so large. I worked on Mac and Connor. You ever been around that area? It's kind of a great place to hang out. But do you know what? There were other believers in that place. And when I found out who they were, we began to pray together. We had Bible studies on our lunch break. And we began believing the Lord. And you know what? God began to do something. I'll never forget the day that George got fired. That evil, slimy guy who had an uncle who was in management, finally lost his job for doing some terrible thing at work, and he didn't get away with it this time. Do you know that my heart was actually sad? It hurt me to know that he was getting kicked out of that place because I'd been praying for George. But you know what? There was work to be done, both spiritually and otherwise, and I had found my cause. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ. About Three months later, we were working overtime, and it was a Saturday right around noon, and I was inside the tool crib taking orders, and the overhead door went up, and a figure walked into the doorway with light glowing around him, tall guy. And as he walked out of the light, the bright light, he had a giant smile on his face. He kind of looked familiar, but I didn't really know him because he was all clean cut and clean shaven. He, he looked clean and he was dressed up really nice. And he walked in and he slammed his hands. And as soon as he did, I knew who it was. On the counter, it was George. And he said, you'll never guess what happened to me. <laughs> is his exact first words to me. And I knew instantly that he had gotten saved. At the lowest point of his life, he gave his life to Jesus. He said, you know what? Would you come to my baptism? I said, I'll be there, George. And Robin and me and some of my friends and people in the plant all went down on the other side of town to watch George get baptized. A complete transformation. I had found my cause. Well, today, I want you to know that we have to choose our cause and we also have to pick our sweet spot. Let me go over this with you. Choose your cause and pick your sweet spot. Now, some of you may have played racket sports, and I always loved racquetball. I still do. I don't get to play, but I want to start playing again. And this old racket has served me well. I have defeated a lot of foes with this racket. Accidentally hit a few, by the way, but not on purpose. It's a graphite racket. I really like it. You know what, though? There's only a little tiny spot in the middle. 
that when you hit the ball, it really moves. If I hit it over here or anywhere over here, it's not really going to be a strong hit. I'm not going to have the control on the outer edge. And there are times where you don't miss, you misjudge the ball and you tip it off the end. And, you know, before you know it, you lost a point. But there's a spot called the sweet spot. And boy, when you find that sweet spot and you give it that shot, it's like that ball just snaps. Nobody can see it. It's a point. And once you find your cause, God wants you to pick your spot. He needs you to find what you were called for and that sweet spot in your life and serve. That's the application in your message today. And you can think about the racket. Now let's go back to our text, if you will. Now there was a disciple at Damascus. I spent enough time on this on Tuesday, but you can listen to a little more of it. A disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Here's a man, I believe, who knew his cause. Here's a guy who heard the voice of the Lord when God wanted to get a man into the into the game and into action. Here's a guy who may have been sound asleep, but as soon as the Holy Spirit spoke, he woke up and he heard the words of the Lord and he knew exactly what God wanted him to do. And by the way, you're going to see that there's another man brought into the story. His name is Saul. We don't know what kind of man Saul might have been without Christ but we know who he became. But look what the scripture says. For he is a chosen instrument of mine. Now this is why I brought up the King James. The King James says chosen vessel. God is picking things to use and to get his will done on earth. You and I are the tools of the master. And you know that tools are important in any job. As a matter of fact, the wrong tools will get the, the job done wrong. And you know the difference between a good tool and a bad tool. Dad was kind of cheap from time to time. He would buy junky tools because they were on sale. But he always had his craftsman set that he never let me touch. Matter of fact, he had pegboard in the garage, and guess what he had done? He had outlined all his tools because anything that was touched had to go ex back exactly where it belonged. None of that made sense to me, especially when a few years later he gave me for Christmas, are you ready for this, pegboard. I literally got Christmas, one, one year at Christmas I got pegboard to build my own. I was a little bit irritated, but I got over it. I understood what he meant. It's time for you to get your own tools. It's time for you to get organized. You can't just mess up my tools. God chose Saul before Saul knew he was chosen. Now that's Romans 8. I don't know the verse, maybe 29 or 30. Romans 8, 28, you know. But what's the next verse? For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be, that's 29, to be conformed into the image of his son. The word predestined, do you see the two words? Saul was predestined, and God let Ananias, you know when you're in the spirit, when you're mature, when you're growing, and you know your place in the body, God lets you in on stuff? Do you know that Ananias knew before Saul that God had chosen him? Isn't that kind of cool? That's sometimes why when you talk to people, they tell you things that you don't understand. You're not mature enough to get it. Matter of fact, if you're going to be honest, you get mad at them. Because you're like, who does she think she is that she would say that to me? You just don't understand at this point. Ananias, Saul is a chosen instrument. Now that word instrument was also translated in the King James vessel. I want you to think about this. It also has the connotation of a sail. Imagine in the ship called fellowship, that God has decided to use you as one of his sails. 
Isn't that kind of cool? If you've ever seen sailboats, I've only been on a few, one on my honeymoon, and the marriage almost ended on the spot. I had never done it before. You remember that. You were lost. You and I and the rest of the crew were all lost at sea. But let's take it from Gilligan. A ship has many sails. And imagine that God has chosen you, that he calls you, and then says, I want you in the right spot so at the right time I can release you and the wind of the Spirit can blow and you get to do something great for me. Now, what are you doing? Think about it. What does the sail do? Come on. How hard is it for the sail? No, all it does is just be. Right, it captures the wind, that's all. But what does a sail that isn't aloft do? Nothing. Nothing really. Yeah, it makes noise, gets in the way, trips people. Now, here's something fun. When you run into people like Enoch, you know it. You ever met anybody who knows God and knows what they're called to do and will annoy you to death with their calling? <laughs> I mean, when you run into an Enoch, you know it. Because, man, they are so excited about what God is doing. And they can't stop talking about it. I believe Ananias was that way and Saul was beginning to be that way. Read the chapter. When, he, when God does, I don't want to break the surprise for you, but when God does all those things for him, the Bible says immediately he went out and preached. Well, sure, he had something to say. He had a testimony already. You know, my dad loved to garden. He, he loved it. And I, I knew I was in trouble when I showed up at his house in those later years of his life and he was dressed, I'm just going to say it, all funky. My dad looked like a homeless man. When he was working, doing anything, you, you would just think he just fell out of a boxcar somewhere in the 1940s because he just, he had old raggedy boots and baggy, baggy clothes and a hat that somebody gave him for free, uh, usually a funeral home hat, you know. I don't know why he liked wearing them because they were free. And so he would have a garden, and, you know, I'd come over, and as soon as I saw him dressed like that, I knew what was going to happen next. He would say, hey, come on, I want to show you my garden. Well, I never had time for anything that took longer then I wanted to give, and a garden, and fishing, and golf, and all those things that most people love, I never liked. But I would go out, because you know I loved my dad. And I would go out to his garden. Now, I found, I looked up, I searched for a picture, and I could not get a picture of my dad in front of the garden, but here is a picture of my sister with that dog I told you about. Remember Lightning? What color is he? That's right, he was black. But there was dad's prized tomatoes. He loved, he had sometimes 15, 20 tomato plants, and he would work them. And you know why Italians make tomatoes, don't you? Right? You know why they grow tomatoes? Why? Because is the answer. Because of everything. My dad ate them raw. It was salt. He ate them on his sandwiches. He had them in his salads. And most importantly, he wanted mom to try to make sauce. She never liked using fresh tomatoes because she said they were too acidy. And she preferred puree and canned tomato paste. That was my mom. That's what she liked. But she would do it for him. And he would get me to go out there, and then we would weed the garden together, and he would brag about his tomatoes. And he grew other things. He loved zucchini. How many have ever raised zucchini? Do you know that there are flowers that don't produce zucchini, right? You know that? Well, you pick those and you put them in a batter and they're little frittatas. They, they're like a little side thing. And they're fabulous. They're really good. I found them in one store, Westbourne Market in Dearborn, somewhere back in the past. I saw them selling them. All right. And it was Dad's passion. It's what he wanted. He felt good and right. You know what he told me? He says, you can't change people, but you can grow a tomato. You know, and sometimes you need that. See, God desires to see things that he loves grow. My dad loves seeing. He loved his sweet little lettuce. He would just run his hand 
his big chubby fingers with this ring. He'd run it over his lettuce. And he would tell me about the bib lettuce, and he would tell me about this lettuce. And he would, oh, you can't pick it yet. But when it got to a certain height, he had those scissors that looked like they came out of the Smithsonian. And he would cut the lettuce because you could cut it and regrow it three or four times. And he loved his lettuce. But you know what? Dad loved to see things grow. So what am I saying today? First of all, choose your cause. Make sure you have something to live for. Don't let it just be your job or the responsibilities or the things you have to do. Those are okay. But have a cause. Have something that puts wind in your sails. Second of all, find your sweet spot to serve. Now let me remind you that we spent a whole month talking about our ministry fair and then recruiting people and I have right here a list of 51 people who signed up to serve at Christ's family. But don't think that we forgot about you. We have been praying over those names. We have been talking about those opportunities. We've even been saying, you know what, they want to do this, but this is where God wants them. Who's going to be the one to tell them? And you know what? I'm just the kind of pastor who's willing to say, I'll let somebody else do that. But here they all are. And I'm going to tell you, find your place. So some of you are going to be getting phone calls. And it's a great thing. It's awesome. Come on, is it not great? It's exciting because we should share the joys of being in Christ together. All right. Let's go a little bit deeper, shall we? In Acts chapter 9, let's get back to our story. And the Lord said to him, Ananias, get up and go to the street called Straight. And I love that, a street called Straight. Come on now. You heard of the straight and narrow, right? Inquire at the house of Judas for a man, named, a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. And he has seen in a vision that a man named Ananias come in lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Remember, Saul is blind right now. How many days was he blind? You remember the text? How many? It was three days, absolutely. You'll find a lot of numbers in the Bible. We're going to talk about some today. It's fun. Why three days? I don't know. Maybe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have work to do in those three days, right? So he's blind, but of course, as one of you noted, he had a vision, but he was blind. Isn't that kind of cool? Now look at verse number 13. What are the first two words? Okay, and he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands in him so he might regain his sight. Verse 13, first two words are, but Ananias, uh-oh. I preached a showstopper one time years ago when I said I love the big butts in the Bible. And that was about the last thing I said in that message. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. Now, you notice that there is a lot of talk in the church and in Scripture, and it isn't always good. We got to be careful about what we say. One time I heard my dad say, you know what? It's not my job to chastise another man's servants. I said, what do you mean, Dad? He says, well, if, why should I criticize people when they're not mine, they're his? And I appreciated that. I really did. So what am I saying? While serving, be sure to check your heart regularly. Remember, talked to you about getting a cause, talked about finding your sweet spot to serve, right? But you also need to, when you are serving, to check your heart regularly. But Ananias, Ananias was being real right here. You know, many of the Psalms, about 20% of the Psalms are complaint Psalms. You do know that, right? Right, I made the mistake of, Seeing a woman in labor, she, and I read the psalm, Deliver me, O Lord. That didn't go over well. I was young in the ministry, but it's there. And it was kind of a complaint psalm. 
And Ananias is going to be real with God. But Ananias, God told him what to do, but Ananias had some real concerns. Does anyone see a rebuke in the text for Ananias' questions? I don't. Anybody know anyone else who asked questions of the father? Yeah, you? Yeah, Jesus. What did he say? Yeah, my God. That was on the cross. What did he say in the garden? Yeah, exactly. So while serving, I think we have the right. You know, I was in the police station recently, not for a bad reason, but a good, and one of the sergeants was talking to us. We were talking about situational awareness. And he says, you know, it gets so bad, and this is a wonderful Christian man. There are some beautiful Christian officers that are serving in our community. And I have an opportunity to minister to them and work with them from time to time. And one of them, Sergeant, I don't want to say his name, because I'm going to tell you what he said. He says, yeah, he said, I used to get in trouble with my wife because she would say, why are you looking at the lady's butt? And he said, I'm not looking at her butt. And she said, yes, you are. I just saw you staring at that woman's butt. And he had to take her aside and say, look, I was looking for who in this room is carrying a weapon. And you, if you have a carry license, which I don't, you can see a bulge in a certain part of their pants and you know. And he said, it's my job to know exactly, am I right? Uh, it's my job to know exactly who is and who isn't carrying and what kind of person they are. And he said, watch me, he says, because I'll check out a guy's butt the same way I'll check out a girl's butt. And his wife laughed and said, you know what, it's absolutely true. And she said, that makes me equally uncomfortable <laughs> in public. But it's part of his job. And we all laughed a little bit. Ananias had something to say to God. And God was willing to listen. Look at the scripture in 2 Timothy. All right, that's, there it is. I love this. Paul is training Timothy in the ministry. Okay, so I'm going to give you some training from Apostle Paul. And look what he says. He says, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels. Remember the word vessels but vessels of wood, of earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. When you look at a scripture, I want you to ask questions. Remember, we already determined that we can ask questions. First of all, I want you to think about the words in a large house. Back in Jesus' day, what were the large houses? Synagogues. They were places of gathering, correct? What else? What else? Did the average person live in homes like we do? No, they were, they were palaces. They were mansions. They were places like the synagogue. We were going to have an altar, and they were going to have a lot of um, vessels and elements on that altar that were uh, laden with gold and used. So now you understand what Paul's saying. He's not talking about your kitchen and mine, although... He probably would say the same thing about us. You know that there are, you know the difference between dinnerware and flatware, right? Okay, now I'm talking to the older audience. But dinnerware and the expensive dinnerware is what? Bone china, which is not a beautiful white. It's an off-white, but it's expensive. More expensive than porcelain. And I think I was reading as I was studying a little bit that this Wedgwood Geo brand, a set for 16 was $500, a, a, a set of dinnerware for a, serving 16, $500, and it was just, you know, it was supposed to be so wonderful, and I thought, well, seems like the Corel I have would be holding up since the 90s, so I'm okay. But the point is, in a large house, there are vessels at Christmas time at our house, my mom had a set of dishes that had Christmas trees on the middle. Do you have any special 
dishes that only come out for special occasions. It's kind of sad if you think about it because some of them never get used. And they probably should, and I know why, because it's easier to live normally and you're always worried about breaking them, but we had Christmas dishes and somehow they ended up here at the church after my parents passed away. And someone said, what do you want to do with this whole box of Christmas dishes? Yeah, well, we've got them. I don't know what we're going to do with them, but we've got them. But they're special. But look what Paul is saying here to Timothy. In verse 21, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, that means to wash thoroughly. You ever been out in a restaurant, and are you like me, you check your silverware, right? It's called what, flatware, right? Have you ever found any that were delivered to your table that were not clean? It kind of ruins the meal, at least for me. If anyone cleanses himself from these things, Paul was talking about sin. And it is our job to be vessels of honor. That vessel, that ship that we are a sail on and that part that we play, the cause that we pick up and the spot that we serve in must be done out of a pure heart. There's a reason why we check ourselves regularly. Because guess what? The great house was not a synagogue. It wasn't a palace. It is the kingdom of God. That's what Paul was talking about. That's what we're reading about. That's what the, the Sermon on the Mount was about. That is the great house. The great cause is the kingdom. And we are to be vessels of honor, washed thoroughly. Look what he said. He'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified. You know what the word sanctified means? Set apart. Kind of like those dishes. Maybe you even have a display cabinet. Remember those? Yes, Starsky too. And there they were, all in that beautiful hutch to look at and to admire and to, to someday pass on to another generation. A vessel of honor ready at any time to be used for the master, prepared for every good work. So it talks about cleansing himself. What are the ways that we cleanse ourselves? Let's talk practically. What are some of the ways that we cleanse ourselves based on what we know in the kingdom of God? Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he'll be a vessel for honor. If we are going to have a cause, and we're going to pick a spot to serve, right? It's not enough just to have a cause. You've got to have a place, a responsibility. You've got to sign up. And then you've got to clean yourself. You've got to stay clean. How? How do we do that? Gordon. You know, Gordon just said something powerful, and you won't hear it on the live. I'll repeat it. He said, by obeying being obedient, the word of God. Do you know how a Prius recharges itself electrically? By running and pumping the brakes. I'm not a Prius fan, to be honest. I've driven in one. It was kind of like wearing a Coke can around me. It was way too small, no power. It's so quiet, you don't even know it's running. But it was designed uniquely because... As you drove it, the movement of the wheel and the friction on the brakes recharged the batteries. As you obey, you are cleaning yourself. That's good. What else? How else? Yeah, repenting is another one. Now, what causes us to repent? Think about this. What? Conviction, which comes from? Right, the Holy Spirit, John 14, John 16. Interaction with the Holy Spirit keeps us clean. But I want you to write these verses down, Romans chapter 6, which I know some of you already know, and Ephesians chapter 5. Because the Bible tells us obedience, and you already said this, but let's get specific. If you have not been baptized... 
there may be things in your life that are preventing you from growing out of that childlike stage. Because the Bible says that the washing of the water with the word. Now that doesn't mean the Bible is the water. It means the word tells us to believe and be baptized. Obedience brings us through the sacraments that God has commanded in his word as you do them. Some people say, well, we don't take communion here. You know, there are a lot of churches now that don't take communion. It's controversial. It takes too much time. As the church gets bigger, how do we do it? You know, it's nonsense. But here's the thing. There may be a reason why some of these places are filled with people who are not growing, not reproducing. You know, the silver, I'm going to use it, the good stuff. You know, the flatware that is, you know what the expensive flatware is? It's the forged flatware. It's pieces that, it's one piece of stainless steel that has been forged in what? Well, yes, thank you. It was forged in fire. Those are the things that are vessels of honor. They're in, in real life. Flatware, silver, or, or, or spoons and knives and forks that are forged are strong. They're not going to break. They're not going to bend. They're hardened steel. They're more expensive. But let me tell you something. We got a lot of plasticware Christians going around. You ever use those? It's called one and done, son. You just take that fork and you put it in that salad and snap, it's gone. You use it one time and it's no good. And many believers today are being used one time and they give up on God. They're plasticware Christians and that is not how God called us. We are called to be, at least in the word of God, according to Paul, vessels of honor forged in the fire. Time tested, valuable because we are useful not for us or even a church, but for him, the master. Big difference. So let's wrap this up. What did we say? Choose your cause. Pick your sweet spot and serve. And then be the good stuff. Don't be the cheap stuff. I mean... We use paper plates at our house, too. I, I, I'm convicted about it. I am. I'm, I'm being honest with you. I really don't feel comfortable just throwing stuff away. You know, I can wash a dish. I don't know how, but if you tell me, I'll learn. I mean, think about it. How many plates can we use? Well, lots. I've got to go to the bulk store and i got to buy a 55-gallon drum of plates. And you know what? I'm doing that three months later. I, I, I may not be being a good steward of resources and of this planet and of my own time. I don't know. But you can pray for me because these are the dumb things that I think about. And I'm just being honest and real with you. But let me tell you something. There's a lot of Christians who are the same way. Did you ever try to put a nice, delicious piece of lasagna on one of those little pieces of paper plate that you get at the dollar store? You know what? You just lost your lasagna. They don't hold anything. They're useless. It's like a tissue. You're eating on a Kleenex. And yet so many Christians, the minute that you want them to do anything for Jesus, they don't have the strength, the power, the willpower, the know-how. They're not mature enough to do anything in the kingdom of God. You know what they're good for? Ignoble, dishonorable things. They know how to sin. They know the songs everybody sings. They know the phrases. They know the stats. They know the words. They know all these things. They're good for that. But they can't do anything else. They're one and done plasticware Christians, and I'm telling you, this is not what the kingdom of God is all about. Well, right about this time, I got to do this. Yeah, I had to do it because, you know, 
It's the only way to get you back. Yeah, he's cute, but we can't stay. Because we got to grow. We got to be used greatly. Now, I want you to study something because I can't finish the message today. But in Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 13 is an unusual one verse parable. And if you study it, I'll tell you what it means the next time I'm sharing on a Wednesday. You have to look it up. Luke 13, Matthew 13 is a one verse parable. It's one of the shortest parables Jesus told. The reason why is because it kind of links together with some of the other parables. It goes with the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the weeds and the seeds, a whole bunch of little tiny things. Anybody want to guess what it is? The parable of the... No, that's a good guess. That's the seed, one of the seed parables. It goes like this. Heaven is like... And then it says something that rhymes with heaven. Heaven is like leaven, right, exactly. This, the parable of the leaven. If you study it, I'll preach it. It's so tiny, but so deep. There's so much there. And, and didn't Jesus use leaven as another type of sin? But guess what? Not in this parable. Not at all. He flips it. Yep. It's amazing. And when we talk about growth, parable. Yep, Matthew 13, the end of the chapter, Luke 13. Yep. All right, let me tell you a story, and then I want to pray for you. This is a story of a wise little burrow and a wild stallion. And the wild stallion is young, strong. He's used to having his way, but one day he gets caught. He gets captured because there's a rancher, and he just specializes in in horses. And he's used to wild stallions. He loves them because they're strong. They're young. They're great for lots of things, riding. They're great for breeding. But this stallion was used to being free used to doing what he wanted to do and what no one else wanted to do but him. Well, this rancher captures him, and he says, you know what? I'm going to break you. But he's having a problem because nobody can ride him. Nobody can tame him. He comes up with an idea. He's got this little tiny burrow. This burrow's old and wise. And this burrow does everything that he wants him to do. And he's steady, you know, he just does it day after day. And sometimes he could take him miles away from the ranch on a task. And if he didn't want to drive him home, he lets him loose, and the burro always finds his way home. So the wise rancher has an idea, and he takes a rope, and he ties the rope around the stallion's neck. And then he takes this rope, and he ties the other end firmly around the burro's neck. And then he sends them out into the prairie. He lets them go. Well, the stallion, man, he just goes crazy. He's like, I'm free. And off he goes. And he's dragging this burrow. This burrow's bouncing around like a sack of potatoes. It's almost heartbreaking to see how misused this little burrow is as the stallion just drags him along. And off they go into the distance three days later. Here comes the little burro, trotting along with his head up, heading back home, and behind him with his head down is the stallion. He's been broken. And by the way, ranchers have been doing that for years because for a while, that stallion will go nuts. After a while, that stallion gets tired of having his own way, tired of beating his head against the rock, tired of being that wild, young, undisciplined stallion. And all of a sudden, the burrow's in charge. What he wants to do, the stallion will do. Where he wants to go, the stallion will go. And by the way, the stallion always wants to go right back home to where he knows he's loved and cared for. You and I can grow. 
not only is it good for God, it's good for us. We were designed to grow because it's the only way to live a happy life in Christ. Amen? All right, let's stand. Sorry if I went a little bit long today, but I'm happy to share this with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you desire to use us greatly. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we would surrender, submit our wild hearts to you because really the burrow is the Holy Spirit and we know that he will lead us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Thank you.